Hi everyone, this is David and welcome to today's chat. As you can see in the messages, the comments, today we're going to be covering intonation patterns in English as well as five good tips to help you make your writing more concise, more direct, and more powerful. You're also hearing uh, some Chopin, uh, an etude, by request of uh, one of our regular attendees. Unfortunately, Brandon uh, and uh, Frederick Chopin, I have to stop the music in order to pull up the first screen. So let me uh, share my screen and we'll get started on today's first topic. And today's first topic is intonation patterns in English. Intonation patterns are the second half of learning to speak a different language. The first half is you learn what to say, grammar and vocabulary. But in the second half, you must learn how to say it. As anyone who studied a uh, different language knows, the grammar and the vocabulary can sound a bit robotic as well as not be very understandable without the proper expected intonation patterns. So today, and again, this is at the request of one of our attendees. Today, I wanted to cover the three basic intonation patterns in English. Once you have these three basic ones down, you pretty much have got like 85, 90% of, of what you need. So let's take a look at them. Intonation patterns. The three basic patterns are the falling intonation, where your uh, voice, your pitch falls at the end of the statement. The rising intonation, just the opposite. Your pitch or voice goes up at the end of the statement. And then what's called the non-final intonation, which is a rising and followed by a falling pattern. There is a fourth type of intonation pattern, but it's very difficult to teach. It's called the wavering intonation. And the wavering intonation, as you'll see demonstrated in today's chat, depends a lot upon the idea, the emotions, as well as the nonverbal language that accompanies it. So we'll spend a little bit of time on it, but it's one of those aspects of English that are rather idiosyncratic. Let's take a look first at falling intonation. It is the most basic pattern of English, the one most often used. Again, it is when the pitch of your voice, as well as some stress, lowers at the end of the sentence. And this falling intonation is used at the end of statements. And so that includes a lot of what you will be saying in English. And the falling intonation also covers the five W's and an NH questions. Five W's, who, what, when, where, and why questions, as well as the H, how question. So those are the two areas for falling intonation. Here are some practice sentences. When I say them, and I hope that you take these sentences and along with this video, practice them. When you say this sentence, you notice the falling intonation at the end of this name. My name is Mohammed. Mo, Mohammed. Moha, Mohammed. A falling intonation occurring at the end. Same way with the next one. By the way, I chose that sentence because it, it is one of the first things that we learn to say in English, as is this one. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. A falling, falling intonation at the end. I'm going to the store, I'm going to the cinema, I'm going to the train station, I'm going to the taxi stand. This is a very common utterance as well. I'm going to the cinema. I'm going to the cinema. Cine, cinema, cinema, falling intonation. Here are the questions that we were referring to. Notice these are the five W's and H questions. What's your name? 
What's your name? What's your name? Name. Where do you live? Where do you live? Hear the falling intonation on live. Where receives the major intonation? Because it signals that a question is coming. A where question. How do I open this? How do I open this? You hear the falling intonation on this. So take those sentences as well as the audio that you just heard and make sure that your voice is following that up and down pattern and that it ends in the down or the falling intonation pattern. Okay, the rising intonation. This, of course, is when your voice rises at the end of the sentence. And the sentence can be either a positive statement or it can be a question. The rising int intonation is most often and almost always only seen with yes or no questions. There are a few exceptions to that, and we're going to be covering those in, in just, just a minute. But any question that can be answered with a yes or no, whether or not it begins with a question word like do, any question that can be answered with yes or no has the rising intonation pattern. Here are some of our practice sentences. Are you Canadian? Are you Canadian? In? May I borrow a pencil? Pencil? Again, these are questions that can be answered yes or no. Was the movie enjoyable? Bull? Bull? And I hope you're, you're seeing or hearing here that the advice that ends your questions with the uh, up stress, the up pitch, again, that's not always true. There's a set of questions that have a falling intonation. And as you're seeing here, there is a set of questions that has a rising intonation. Some more. And again, these are, uh, you almost want to call them expletives. Uh, those are things that fill in for regular speech or fragments. But uh, they are also often questions. Really? Did you do that? Really? Someone who's going and you don't expect them to leave. So soon? You're going so soon? Notice that these can also be answered yes or no. This is a common idiom, seriously, when it's not a question, but when it's a question, seriously, seriously, are you telling the truth? Seriously, that's what I have to do for an A? Rising intonation. Okay, let's put these together. Let's identify falling and rising intonation and a kind of scramble of sentences here. Do you know that woman? Immediately, you should say, that is a question that could be answered yes or no. So it has rising intonation. Do you know that woman? Do you know that woman? Do you know that woman? Contrast that with uh, part of the five W's and the H. How do you know that woman? How do you know that woman? The down intonation on woman, or said down falling. Here we have a question. It's one of the five W's and an H. So what's it going to have? Falling intonation. Why do you go to school here? Why do you go to school here? Falling intonation. Because it's a five W and an H question. Next. A do question is going to be answered yes or no. Do you go to school here? Do you go to school here? Rising intonation. Did you buy a new laptop? Now that is a question that can be answered yes or no. It is not a 5W and an H question. Therefore, it has a rising intonation. Did you buy a new laptop? Did you buy a new laptop? Laptop. 
<clears throat> this is a 5W and an H question. What? So it's going to have a falling intonation. What kind of laptop did you buy? What kind of laptop did you buy? Where? That's a 5W and an H. So it's going to have a falling intonation. Here it is. Where do you work? Where do you work? Work. Look, falling intonation. Lowering the pitch. Letting up the stress. It's a do question. It can be answered yes or no. Therefore, it's going to have a rising intonation pattern. Do you work from home? Do you work from home? Do you work from home? Home? Okay, again, practice those along with the audio that you're hearing. Oh, we have two more. Sorry. Do. Is that a yes or no question? If it's a yes or no question, then it must be rising intonation. Do you know that professor? Do you know that professor? And do you know that anything? Do you know that student? Do you know that movie? And then how is a 5W and an H question, the H here. So therefore, it's going to have a falling intonation. How do you know that, professor? How do you know that, professor? As you can tell, the 5Ws and H questions have the stress at the beginning of the, um, of the utterance. Okay, let's look also at this last intonation pattern. It's called the wavering intonation. And the wavering intonation varies according to your need and emotion. So you're going to be expressing a variety of emotions with uh, stress, pick, pitch, and juncture. Uh, let's kind of take a look at all these at, at once. Now, you can say thanks a lot in a normal way. You can say it in a grateful way, a sarcastic or ironic way, an incredulous way. And there could be many other emotions that you can express with those three simple words. So what's going to happen is you're going to use a variety of what's called super segmentals or prosody, stress, pitch, juncture, which is how the pause you put between words. You're going to use a variety of those to convey these things. First, normal. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. You gave me this. I really appreciate it. So sincerely, thanks a lot. Now, if you're overjoyed that someone gave you something, you're going to use a different intonation pattern to express this abundance of gratitude. Thanks a lot. Really, this meant so much to me in my life. Thanks a lot. Then, of course, there's the sarcastic or ironic. In other words, you mean the opposite of what you say, which is what irony is. And someone did something for you. It didn't help. It hurt. And so you say, thanks a lot. Really, thanks a lot. There, there's a, a lot of emotion and as well as <clears throat> nonverbal expressions in that. And then there's incredulous, which means, really, or are you serious? Or can that be true? Uh, you did this for me, and I don't understand why you did it. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, am I supposed to be thankful here? Thanks a lot. And there, as we said, there could be many more of these. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I just noticed, I think I have my slides messed up. We did not cover the uh, wavering intonation pattern. So I will have to uh, see what's going on there. Well, I did not cover the wavering intonation pattern. My slides got messed up and I, I mean, the um, the uh, the one the that doesn't end with the non-ending sentence. I, I can't believe I, I left that out. 
Well, I will have to give that to you guys at a later time. Let me see if I can pull from my notes. I might be able to pull it up as a Word document that I was using. And let me find the Word doc. Here's the Word doc. I will pull it up, increase the size, and I will share the screen. And we'll go over a wavering intonation. Sorry about that, folks. I, I did such a good job on the uh, uh, on the slide too. I'm kidding. Okay, non-final intonation. I left this slide out. Non-final intonation is used in four cases. Unfinished thoughts, that's where you begin with an introductory clause or phrase that is unfinished. Introductory phrases are in clauses, set off by a comma. Uh, any series, words, phrases, even clauses can be put in series. And here we're talking about any number. And then choices, where you have alternative choices within one sentence. So let's go over these. And again, I'm sorry I left out the slide. Notice the unfinished thought here. She bought the magazine. How we how kind of end on a rising intonation. And then we're going to finish with a falling intonation. But she didn't read it. She bought the magazine, but she didn't read it. So we have two major patterns here because the first is an unfinished thought. It is a rising and the second finishes the thought it's falling. When I finished university, I got a job. I, when I finished university, I got a job. Unfinished thoughts. If I, if I study hard, I'll pass the test. If I listen to Chopin, I'll fall asleep. Introductory phrases and clauses. These are very much like unfinished sentences, except they're considered introductory uh, phrases and can be even introductory words or transitions that introduce the sentence. As a matter of fact, I do know where she lives. As a matter of fact, I do know where she lives. As far as I'm concerned, She's not suitable for that position. As far as I'm concerned, rising, she was not suitable for that position, falling. Here's the single word transition. Actually, the movie was pretty good. Therefore, I will not grant an exception. However, the days become shorter as the night goes on. I don't think that last sentence made any sense. Here's a, a series. No matter how many you have in the series, you have rising intonation on all the items except the last. I like playing football. These are such American sports, sorry. I like playing football, tennis, basketball, and volleyball. Volleyball. I like playing football, tennis, basketball, and volleyball. He left work came home, took a shower, and went to bed. It falls on the last item. And then for expressing cho choices. Here we have two choices expressed in one question. Do you want to stay home or go to the movies? Do you want to stay home or go to the movies? Are you going to travel in March or April? So that last item always has that falling intonation. And here's wavering int intonation. So uh, let's go back here and let me see if there are any questions about intonation. Uh, Brandon, how's it going? Did you have any questions about intonation, Brandon, before we uh, move on? Falling intonation, the most common. 
rising intonation used especially with questions. Uh, Non-final intonation used with uh, complex sentences with a beginning and end parts. And then the one that you really is, have a hard time keeping track of, wavering in, in, intonation, where you vary a lot of things in order to express emotion. Okay, any any questions? And while Brandon is thinking of a question, or anybody who is on the chat, if you have questions, please let me know. I will go ahead and tee up the next item. Okay, uh, Brandon, thank you very much for that response. Um, judging upon your writing ability, Brandon, the comments that you have typed into the uh, chat box here in previous chats, I would say that you are, if not a native speaker, you're, you're at least bilingual because of the rather advanced writing style that you use. Is that correct, Brandon? You're either a native speaker or bilingual. In other words, I don't think that you would have a lot of problems with these basic patterns of intonation. Okay, the in this part of the chat, before we get to the question and answer uh, session, I want to just briefly, briefly review uh, these five tips that I hope that in your writing that you take advantage of because they can really be helpful. And of course, during a live chat, that is the cue for the maintenance crew to come in, mow, mow yards. I don't know if you can hear the loud lawnmower outside, but I'm, I'm certainly hearing it. <clears throat> okay, let's go ahead and get into these uh, tips. These are tips designed to help you write more concisely. And that concision also makes your writing more direct. And when it becomes more direct, it becomes more powerful. So let's take a look at some of the suggestions. Basically, my suggestions revolve around these two principles right here, which are less is more. A shorter is better. Let me make this point first. It's perfectly okay on a first draft to really let your uh, words flow and to focus on your thoughts and not how you are expressing those thoughts. I really hope that you are doing that. That you, whenever you're writing a first draft, that you are simply trying to make a connection between the ideas hidden in your head, in your thoughts, and the language that you can use to express them. That's the goal of a first draft, to get thoughts down in an organized way. Now, what I'm talking about here, when it comes to less is more, the shorter, the better. I'm talking about in your second or third drafts, when you go back to polish it before you submit it. And this is when the thoughts are down, and now you can sharpen those thoughts. Now you can brush those thoughts, put a fine point on those thoughts and that organization by in implementing these tips that I'm going to show you now. Okay, let's take a look at a few of them. I call them the five steps to clarity. I have uh, five more, and I'm going to make another video. This video was uh, 11 minutes long, and uh, I didn't want to make a 20-minute video. So I will be following this one with a, another one. And the first tip is avoid nouning. Another name for this is nominalization, and you can see why I didn't use that word, nominalization. 
Yeah, Brandon, I thought you were uh, a native speaker who is bilingual. What are your other languages, Brandon, besides English? Hi, Jason. Glad to have you here. And by all means, Jason, whenever you have questions, come right on in. Nouning is where you use a noun to hide what could be a strong verb in your construction, in your sentences. You're welcome, Jason. You're welcome very much. So here's our first example. Whoops, went a bit too far. The driver gave assistance to the injured. Now, any of these words that end in ants or shuns are usually good candidates for denouning. And so we're going to denoun this sentence. Look inside that word, assistance, and you see very clearly that we could take that two-word construction and four-word, four-syllable, with four syllables, and reduce it to one word in two syllables, the driver assisted. We don't really need the gave there. It is an example of nouning, and we want to denoun it. it sounds a lot like deworming, doesn't it? Let's look at another example. This is a very typical of academic writing. And one of the reasons that, that I wanted to share these tips is that most of you are on the graduate level and you're writing your theses and you're writing your dissertations. And one of your temptations is going to be to copy some of the really bad academic writing that you will encounter during your research phase. That's interesting, Brandon, Vietnamese. What a what an interesting language that is. It's very much a tonal language, whereas uh, English is very much an intonation uh, language. And of course, Spanish is a romance language, so it, uh, it shares a lot of characteristics with English, except for the German ones. But what I wanted to warn you guys against is picking up some of the bad habits from all of the academic writing that you're going to be reading for your uh, the very um, lengthy and serious kinds of works that you'll be writing. Look at this sentence. The scholar conducted an investigation into the causes of genocide. <sighs> conducted an investigation. That is, what, eight syllables? that in three words that could be reduced to one word in three syllables. The scholar investigated the causes of genocide. And you think, okay, well, what's the big deal here? Okay, so you saved five syllables. So you saved two words. Here's the big deal. If you do this throughout the thing that you're writing, whether it's a thesis or dissertation or a project for a undergraduate course. If you do this, your the overall effect will be on your writing profound. And the, that profound effect takes place sentence by sentence as you go through and do your revision work. So don't think of these as, oh, that's just one sentence. I'm not going to worry about it. This is an overall strategy to make your writing more concise, direct, and uh, believable. Okay, see if you can pick out the verb being hidden by the noun. Remember, watch out for the shun verbs, whether they're S-I-O-N or T-I-O-N. Beware of the shun verbs. Brandon, Jason, anybody else who is here? Give me the verb. Memorial Hospital broke to close its trauma center. What is the verb? I know YouTube has a 10 second delay on these live streams. So I'll count down. When you get a second, give me that verb. Usually Jason and Brandon are right on it here. Memorial Hospital made a decision, reduce that to one 
word verb. Yes. Thank you, Sil. Thank you. That is it. You now have denounced that sentence, Sil. And since the word made is in the past tense, all you got to do is put your verb uh, in the past tense. But you chose, you're, you're giving me the root, that verb, and that's exactly what I wanted, Sil. So thank you. Congratulations, you have denounced a sentence. Again, I want to emphasize, do not think about these things during your first draft. In your first draft, write freely, let it flow, connect words and thought without worrying about what the words are. Once you got something down, then you can go back and employ these strategies. Okay, next tip. Watch out for expletives. The word expletive in English has two meanings. It could be either a swear or an oath. Blank you all to Hades. Or uh, another definition of expletive is any filler word. It's a word that doesn't carry any meaning, but simply occupies a space in a sentence that uh, allows for a certain structure in that sentence. Yeah, exactly, Brandon. Thank you. Uh, still beat you to the gun there, Brandon. You gotta you gotta warm up those keys and get get going here. Okay, let's look at some expletives. The primary uh, expletives in English are there are, there is, it is, and it is. The it and the, and the there expl expletives. So here we have a there expletive. There are three qualifications, and that expletive works well. Because you want to put the emphasis on the actual qualifications, there are works to shunt those things to the end of the sentences. Uh, you could also say it without the expletive. You could also say all, all applicants must possess uh, three qualifications. That's another way of saying it. But there does a pretty good job, as does it. It is essential. If you really wanted to put the emphasis on essential, you could begin your sentence with an expletive, it, so that essential, which is an adjective, uh, gets the same emphasis as a subject would. And that's really what's going on there. It's essential that we restore faith in our entire judicial system. So it's not like these expletives don't have use. They do. However, Whenever you can change an expletive, do so, unless you have a darn good reason for keeping it. Let me give you some examples of those. There are a dozen students who volunteered for the experiment. Unless you're in some kind of special case there, you can very easily get get rid of, what, five words there? I think the expletive there and its support word accounts for, excuse me, three words. Three words. A dozen students volunteered. And that's a lot more direct. There's no reason to have to jump through that there are hoop. Same for this one. There are many cases in which politicians, yeah, you can see some circumstances that somebody just said something, and, and the person says, you know, our politicians do a great job of connecting. And you go, wait a minute. There are many cases. And see, there you want to put the emphasis on many. But that's, that's a very special situation. Normally, if you're in the business of saying things in a more direct way or in as a concise way as you can, you can take that 12-word sentence and knock it down to five or six. Looks like, oh, excuse me, seven knock it down to seven. Politicians often fail to connect with voters. If you want to use that as a topic sentence, if you want to use that as a main idea that you're going to discuss, you want to express it without the expletive. Oh boy, time's getting away from us here. Okay, I'll let me hurry through some of this stuff. It is necessary for Americans to understand multiculturalism. Again, if you want to put that idea in a prominent place in your writing. You want to put the, uh, the, uh, the nouns that are doing the action first. You want to get right to the characters 
that you are addressing. Americans must understand multiculturalism. And there you get the emphasis on Americans and must, and also multiculturalism because you put it at the end. But the it is necessary for the, uh, the emphasis is lost on Americans, which is one of the groups of people who have problems with multiculturalism. Here is a typical academic sentence. It has been argued by, how many times have you run across that in your academic writing? This kind of puffery. It has been argued by Stinson that there is no topic in education today on which there is greater agreement. It's got all the great academic puff words, the it expletives, the their expletive, and the which clause. Uh, I think that's a um, hat trick in, uh, in many sports, isn't it? And that can be easily reduced. Please, God, reduce that to Stinson argues that no topic in education today is greater agreement. I guarantee you, your thesis, your dissertation will be more convincing with sentence number two than it will be with sentence number one. Now, can I make a caveat to that? You might have a thesis advisor you might have a dissertation advisor or a thesis committee or dissertation committee that prefers sentence number one. This is especially true with sociologists. Not to single anybody out, but it, this kind of puffery is especially evident in the social sciences. And if that's the case, if your advisors are saying, you know, this doesn't sound academic enough, now you know what they're saying. They are saying, go back and puff it up with expletives, uh, nouning or nominalization, and these other devices. Because there are, there are journals out there in which that kind of sentence, number one, that kind of language is not required, but rewarded. Still, ask a question. Should I really avoid expletives in academic writing? Sometimes I use one in a sentence in a paragraph because I just couldn't think of it. Oh, that's a that's a great question still. And it I think is a good example of how it's okay to use them when you're just starting to get words down and you can't think of any other way to say it. I guarantee you that our speech patterns will be the ones that first get put down on paper. Our speech patterns, if you've ever recorded your speech, are not as nearly concise or precise as writing. And I think that's what's happening there. It's perfectly fine to get all that stuff down on your first draft, but then go back and use these techniques. You got it. You got it, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon, for you. You're all warmed up and ready to go now. Now, when you say delivered the message, Sill, are you talking about something written or are you, some, are you talking about something in speech? I think when you said deliver, I think you're still talking about writing there. I just want to, I just want to be sure. Another thing I would say to Sill, Sill, if it really does seem like the right thing to do, then do it. If it is, seems like the right thing for that sentence, that paragraph, that professor, that thesis advisor, if it seems right, do it. Only use these when you think they can help you. Gotcha. Okay, thank you, so. I thought so. So only use these when they when you think they can help you. I do want to make that distinction, though, between our speech patterns and our, the kinds of words we use when speaking and our written uh, patterns. They're very different. And when on a first draft, more than likely, that draft is going to represent or reflect speech patterns more than the final written pattern. Pre, uh, Pratik, can you tell me what you mean there? Without expletives, thesis is question. Are you talking about in your the thesis you're writing that without expletives, you're afraid that it might not 
be what it should be. Yes, it does, Sil. And your emoji is exactly right. You know why I can say that and not feel, and nor should you feel uh, embarrassed by it or like you're giving in? Because there's one rule and one rule only in writing. And here it is. I'm about to tell you everything I've learned about writing during my 30 years of teaching it. There's only one rule in writing. The audience rules. There's only one rule in writing. The audience rules. Whatever the audience wants, that's what you give them. Bottom line. Pratik, it sounds like you're in the same situation as Sil. That this, the expletive-filled writing is something that your advisor expects, is something that your department expects. Okay. I might still kind of push Sil and Pratik into trying it a little bit. Ask yourself this question. What's happening here in this chat with David? Is it because I'm just used to using expletives? Is that why I want to hang on to them? Is it that because that's my comfortable style of writing? Is that why I want to hang on to them? So I would just push you just a little bit, just to try a little bit of this and to see what happens. You're welcome, Sil. That's why I'm here. I'm here, here every Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Where are you from, Sil? I don't think you've ever been here before. Where are you from and um, what level are you studying at? Bachelor's, master's, or doctorate? Okay, let's move along with our advice. Don't let it be. These these might also, these forms of be, as you know, be is the most common verb in English. And with all the forms there, you can see why. That's only six of them. I think there are like 12, which you add in all the perfect tenses and whatnot. And the progressive t- tenses being, um, it's the most common verb in English. And that's a good thing and bad thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a good thing in that once you learn, learn it, you can learn to say a lot of things. It's a bad thing in writing because the B verbs express a static state of being. It does not express anything other than this abstract state. And in writing, you you might want your writing to be a bit more active, a bit more muscular, a bit more direct. And so that's one of the reasons that one of the things you can do in your writing is to be on the lookout for good chances to change the the Bs. Look at the uh, difference between these two sentences. I submit to you that the first sentence that uses the B verb is weaker than the second sentence. Is running is a diluted form of the verb runs. In one, we have a state of being. In the second, we have action. Osil is from Indonesia. It's past midnight there. Yeah, you guys are like, uh, what, seven hours ahead? And you're, you're on a different day too, right? You're a new subscriber and you're a graduate student. Okay, great. Great to have you, Sil. What university do you go to in Indonesia? Same way with Paul here. Just look at those. One is a state of being. One shows action. And I'm saying these are short, kind of obvious examples. But what I'm saying is that another thing you can do in the revision stage of your writing is to go back and have less of a static state of being in your sentences and prefer action whenever you can. This is the passive sentence, uh, passive voice sentence. Um, I don't dwell a lot on the passive voice sentence because it is so useful in English. I'm not one of those teachers who are going to say, set your Grammarly to flag all passive voice sentences. And especially in academic writing, 
the passive voice is really the only way that you can say things sometimes. If you find yourself using the passive voice too much, uh, if you find yourself using the passive voice when using the active voice might help, then uh, correcting it or changing it is quite, uh, quite easy. You simply delete the B and make the, uh, the object the doer, make the object the subject. Formalized culture. Can you tell me what that means, Brandon? Are you in favor of formalized culture or... Twelve hours. That's right. That's right. That's right. I used to teach some students in Indonesia, and I always had to remember they were exactly twelve hours ahead. That's right. Yeah, GMT is always plus seven, right? Okay, or minus seven. I guess it could be, huh? For you. Uh, these are words that I bet your advisor does not want you to use. These are called empty modifiers, and they're called empty modifiers for a reason. They serve to signal some kind of intensity, and that's good. However, there is no degree of intensity that is shown, and it's that missing of the degree or how much or how little that, or how many, that really makes them bad. So look at these right here. The really bad news. Well, that could mean the news was terrible. That could mean the news was frightful. It could mean the news was disturbing. It could mean the, the news was devastating. It could mean the news was re really does not show us a clue as to what this sentence actually means. Uh, as I make, I make the point here that the word very is actually prohibited in most publications. Again, it's something that you might write because on a first draft because it's something that is very much a part, I just used it, very much a part of our speech patterns. But you can almost always um, benefit by finding out what you really meant by very afraid. Did you mean terrified, scared out of your wits by very, very neat? How neat, immaculate, uh, orderly. How neat did you mean? Very dirty. How dirty, filthy. Now one book, and I, I, I do not have any affiliate thing here. I do not get any money for recommending this book, but I have had a copy of the synonym finder and I used to work for the man who wrote the synonym finder. I used to work at Rodale Press and J.I. Rodale, Jerome Irving Rodale was the founder of the, uh, of uh, Rodale Press. And as you can tell, this is a very old copy of the synonym finder. And I've had it since the eighties. Exactly, Pratik. Thank you very much. That sums it up perfectly. Um, if I do not recommend a thesaurus, I recommend the Synonym Finder, and I think it is online these days. J.I. Rodell does a wonderful job, better than any thesaurus I've ever seen, of breaking down a word into its formal, informal, uh, figurative, decorative, a lot of different levels that a theosaurus doesn't have. And I, most of the writers I know, and I was a magazine editor for 10 years, uh, use a tool like the Synonym Finder. Again, on the first draft, it's a brain dump. But then in the revision stage, that's where you go back and do just what Pratik said use specific expressions. Oh, that's right, Brandon. Yeah, that's a good observation. When it, and there might be audiences that expect that Brandon wrote, 
It's like you have the need to sound journalistic and professional. So you have to wordify it. Instead of journal, journalistic means the opposite there, I think. Journalistic, if you've looked at the AP style, you're quite limited in the kinds of sentences and paragraphs you can write. Journalistic style is direct, succinct, and almost Hemingway-like in its shortness. Uh, professional can apply to a lot of professions. I'm more comfortable with the phrase academic because I recognize, and this I'm speaking to Brandon's great comment here, I recognize the difference between consumer writing, there you got magazines, newspapers, and other journalistic efforts, and academic writing, which are peer-reviewed publications, and also theses and dissertations, which are also peer-reviewed. And it is true, Brandon, Brandon is exactly right here, that those forms of academic writing often must be wordified to meet the expectations of the audience. My last tip, oh yeah, things in a lot of, I don't think you guys have a problem with that, is I uh, chopped the dead wood. I, again, you guys might be giving me some grief on this one because a lot of, the, a lot of this so-called dead wood might be things that your advisors like due to the fact that, which can be replaced by a single word, because uh, the fact of the matter is that, which can be completely deleted and doesn't need any replacement words at all. Uh, I guess you could put an intensifier in there. Indeed, our experimental progress. Certainly, our exter experimental progress. But you certainly don't need all seven of those. During the course of, instead of just during, take into consideration, these are my greatest hits of Deadwood, take in, into consideration instead of consider, with the exception of, instead of accept. So there you go. Uh, thank you for kind of going through all of that stuff with me. And I will go ahead and remove that and get to your questions and concerns. Beyond all that, could I get some reactions to uh, that PowerPoint on intonation? This was something that I think uh, Chen Li from China asked me about, and uh, I, I didn't know if it kind of fulfills that need or not. So if you could give me a little feedback on the intonation presentation, do you want more of that kind of thing? What, what other kinds of uh, topics in language learning that you would like me to, call, to cover? We're dealing with that 10 second delay again. I'll just keep talking to kind of fill the gap here. Again, this is an open question portion of the chat, as well as any comments on the presentations today. Um, I have another five tips. Here's Pratik. Pratik writes, uh, well, I'll go ahead and put this on the. Pratik writes, I often found in some research journals, for the first time we found that yeah, I, I think I, that sounds fine. Um, I'm assuming that the use of the we there was okay. Some journals say no personal pronouns, and some journals uh, can allow the researchers or the writers to refer to themselves in the journalistic uh, we. So I, I, is that what you're asking, Pratik, is whether it's okay to use the word we there? Sill asks about voice, passive voice in academic writing. Um, I had a slide up briefly, Sill, in, in that uh, 
last presentation I did. And again, I will repeat my stance on passive voice. I am not one of those teachers who says flag and correct all passive voice sentences. The passive voice is too useful. In academic writing, it's just too, it's too useful in legal writing. It's just wrong to come out and say that. However, I, I challenge you to find places where the passive voice is not needed and can be corrected. I actually have a, a, uh, a lesson on passive voice. And if you want me to, I'll go ahead and turn that into a video and I'll post that video on my channel. It's all ready to go. I just got to do a voiceover and videotize it. And that, that should help. But passive voice sometimes good. Passive voice sometimes obviously not necessary and should be changed. And I can do a video for you showing the difference. Okay, other questions? I'm sorry, that was Sill's question. Are we going over the, uh, oh, thank you, Brandon, for that question. Uh, we only have four minutes left. <laughs> so uh, it sounds, uh, I will go ahead and put the last five tips into a video and I will go ahead and post them on my channel. And I can also, I'll also do quick presentations of those in our, in our next chat. Sill, that would be wonderful. You're welcome, Sill. My pleasure. One of the reasons I'm doing these chats and do them for free, uh, I don't want any kind of membership crap, that kind of stuff, is um, getting having this chance to interact with you guys really tells me a lot about what my audience needs. You know, it helps me uh, define your needs and meet those needs. So I, uh, I'm definitely here every Wednesday, I'm definitely open to your, to your questions and your dialogue. Oh, fast time writing, as in the SAT. And also the uh, ILETs, right? I don't know if you guys have taken the ILETs or not. <clears throat> IELTS, excuse me, I pronounced that wrong. IELTS. But the IELTS and the SAT, as well as any of those timed standard examinations require for you to go in there having a clear cut strategy for producing a quick five paragraph essay. And so for the IELTS and the TOEFL, thank you, Syl, for the IELTS, for the TOEFL, for the SAT, I teach a very patterned five paragraph structure and I, I actually have a lesson that shows you how to take any prompt that they give. And I'll, I'll do a video on that. On the, uh, I'll do like TOEFL prompts. I'll do the IELTS uh, prompts. I'll do the SAT prompts. And I have a method that shows you how to turn any of those prompts immediately into a quick five paragraph essay. So I definitely have my marching orders for this next week. That's a great idea for an essay. Hey, so which uh, which city in Indonesia do you live, Sil? My friends and students were in, um, what's the city in the south that begins with an S? I forget. It. It's Indonesia's second largest city. Can't believe that I forgot it.
Bandung, excuse me, not Surabaya, Bandung. My friends were in Bandung. You live in Bandung. Wow. I should tell you the names of my friends and see if you guys, I know it's a huge city, but see if you guys know each other. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I was thinking of Surabaya for another reason, but uh, they lived in bon, Bandung. I, I started teaching uh, some students when they were 10, and I taught them all the way through when they were 16 in uh, Bandung. One of my students recently got married. It was really fascinating to watch the Indonesian marriage uh, rituals and customs. It was really, really beautiful, beautiful wedding. Of course, it helps to have a mother who was a seamstress and sewed the bridal gown. Oh, okay. Well, I got, I got one o'clock. Okay, so for this next week, I'm going to focus on these three things. Doing a video presentation on how to attack the TOEFL, IELTS, SAT, SA portions. Uh, a quick video on passive voice. It's not very long at all. And then <clears throat> finishing putting together the five writing tips. That sounds like a lot of work for the coming week. So <clears throat> let me close. Um, well, the 10-year-old, of course, was in grade school. And then eventually uh, uh, one, uh, the Pika, became, uh, when she graduated from high school, she went to a, a trade school. She went to a business school. Yeah. And I, I used to practice my Indonesian with them, and my Indonesian is very, very bad. Okay, so thank you all very much for coming by. Uh, I value your input. I value your responses. And I will see you again next week. Take care. Don't hesitate to get in contact with me if I can help you in any way. Talk to you later. Bye. You're welcome, Brandon.